Hello there, my name's Gary. Welcome to my channel, welcome back if you've been here before. So today we are taking on the Boeing B-17G Flying Fortress in 172nd scale from Airfix. Bit of a beast disc kit, 245 parts, a lot of which are transparencies and guns. First of all, I'll have a look at the brief history of the B-17. Then I'll have a look at all the goodies you get inside the box here. And then I'll show you how I made my one. All of these bits are in chapters, so you can hop backwards and forwards as you wish. If you enjoy the video, please do remember at some point to click on the link in the bottom right there, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the channel. This will allow you to see other builds and other projects and new builds as they are done. If you really, really like the video, you might want to consider supporting the channel. You can do this through either Patreon or Buy Me A Coffee follow the links in the box below. Also in the box below is a link to the Airfix online site. If you go through this link and buy anything at all, then at no extra cost to you, this channel gets some pennies from Airfix. Of course, if you're in the Airfix club, buying online, you'll also get a 10% online discount. So with that out of the way, let's get on and have a look at the history of the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. The Boeing B-17 was a four-engined heavy bomber that has become an icon in the history of air warfare, especially over Europe. In 1934, the US Army Air Corps issued a requirement for a bomber to replace the Martin B-10. The requirement specified being able to reach Hawaii, Alaska or Panama from the continental USA. Boeing, Douglas and Martin all submitted entries. The Douglas design was the twin-engined DB-1 based on the company's DC-2 airliner. Martin offered the also twin-engined Model 146. The four-engine Boeing design was initially called the Model 299. A reporter at the Seattle Times, seeing the numerous defensive guns on the Model 299, dubbed the aircraft a 15-ton flying fortress. Boeing quickly trademarked the name. During a fly-off, the Martin design was quickly rejected. The Boeing Model 299 was doing very well until a crash on takeoff, later identified as due to control locks being left in place. After that incident, the Douglas design went on to be ordered as the B-18 Bolo. The DB-1 also had a lower unit price, a very important consideration during the Great Depression. Orders for the YB-17, as the Boeing aircraft had become known, were cancelled. However, the US Army Air Corps still wanted to see what the B-17 could do. They exploited a legal loophole in a contract and in 1936 were able to order 13 YB-17s for service testing. One positive outcome from the Model 299 accident was the introduction of a pre-flight checklist, a safety check completed by every aircraft crew on all types of aircraft around the world to this day. The B-17 entered service in 1939. Various improvements to the design and the engines led to the B-17E and the B-17F, the first models truly designed for offensive warfare. They had a larger tail fin, better flaps and better defensive armament. Shipped to Europe in large numbers, the B-17 became the backbone of the US 8th Air Force, based in the UK flying daylight raids over Europe. Despite its numerous guns and box formations for mutual defence, the B-17 suffered losses from anti-aircraft fire and fighter attack. The Luftwaffe discovered that the best approach was a head-on attack and many B-17s were shot down this way. Thus the B-17G was born, increasing the number of defensive guns from 7 to 13, including forward-firing guns in a chin turret. In combat, the B-17 would routinely carry over 11,000 50 caliber rounds for defence, in addition to its bomb load of between 4 and 8,000 pounds. Eventually, long-range escort fighters, such as the P-51 Mustang, 
gave the B-17 crews a fighter shield all the way to Germany and back. The B-17 was well known by its crews as being capable of taking extreme damage and still flying home. However, the US 8th Air Force still suffered over 47,000 casualties during the bombing campaign, half of the entire US Army Air Force casualties from the whole war. 12,731 B-17s were made, the second largest number for an American bomber. About two-thirds of these were the B-17G model. 46 B-17 aircraft are currently preserved and nine of these are still flying as an ever popular exhibit on the airshow circuit. This kit of the B-17G comes from a 2016 tooling. This is the 2021 release, the fourth re-release so far, which brings new decals. The box is top opening and sturdy. Inside the first thing we see is the instruction booklet. This is quite big as there are a lot of parts, 245 in total, to be expected from a four engine bomber with so many defensive guns. The layout is good with well drawn and clear diagrams. Then there are the colour and decal sheets. First is Scheme A, the box art version an aircraft of the 708th Bomber Squadron of the US 8th Air Force based at Rasselsdon in England. The other is Scheme B, an aircraft charmingly entitled Five Bucks with Breakfast, which flew with the 851st Bomb Squadron out of RFI. Finally, there's the sheet of stencil placements, remarkably few for a US aircraft. Next out of the box is the decal sheet. These are cartograph details, printed to the usual very high standards of sharpness and colour fidelity. At the top are the common decals, these are the national markings and the main stencils. Next the Scheme A markings, including the wing inverted V markings and the green tail hoops. Finally the 851st Bomb Squadron aircraft with lots of red identification flashes. Finally then, the plastic, nine grey sprues and one clear. These four are all the fuselage, wing and tail pieces. Then there's another four covering the engines, interior structures and fittings and the armament. Finally, another grey sprue for the undercarriage and the large clear sprue for all the many, many transparencies. This kit has some complicated bits to do from time to time, so it's been rated at skill level 3 by FX, suggesting that previous model making experience is desirable. The kit also comes with a token for 3 flying hours. You can collect these as a member of the FX club towards a free model in future, or you can donate them to Models for Heroes. A link to this excellent charity is in the information box below. As always, I'm making a start on the cockpit area first. The cockpit area gets a coat of black paint before I start cutting the parts for the flight crew seats from the sprues. These all have these nibs on them that have to be cut off and the excess sanded away. The cockpit walls have been painted dark earth to which I've added some black and silver detailing. There's also an instrument decal for the port wall here. While that's all setting, I'll add these tiny decals to the seats, which, like the structure, have been painted US interior green. Then I can fit the port side wall to the cockpit floor, and followed by the rudder bars. The centre console comes in two halves for some reason. There is a decal for, I guess, a compass. I've also painted the throttle levers aluminium and topped them in black. Then the control column stalks go in, followed by the control wheels. I'll touch up the paint later. Next I'll fit the chair supports to the seat backs, then the chairs can go in with the support arm next to the crew access hole on the floor. With both seats in, 
I can add the starboard side panel and the front bulkhead of the cockpit area. Next in is the instrument panel. I've applied the instrument decals in advance. While that's all settling down, I'll make a start on some of the interior structure by spraying the bomb racks interior green and the rest aluminium. I'll also make the bombs. There are four 500 pound bombs with the kit. Each comes in two halves with separate tailpiece. When they're dried, filled and sanded, I'll spray them in US olive drab. The racks fit onto the structural spars. One larger one in the centre carries two racks, the small ones on either side with one rack each. The bombs come with mountings moulded on to let them sit in the racks. When they're dry I will fit this roof section of the bomb bay to the rear spar. Now the three bomb bay structures glue into the rear spar. Then they're locked into place with the front spar piece like this. Then the back of the cockpit sits on the forward edge of the forward spar. The back of the rear spar gets some radio equipment, as does this back wall for the radio compartment. The floor of the compartment I've sprayed black with a natural wood edging. I'm using a mahogany colour. The rear wall of the radio room sits on this floor piece. Next, I'll, I'll put on some chair legs. And for each of these chairs, there's a seat and a seat back as separate items that need to be glued up. Then the chairs can go into place. I'll leave all that alone for a while. The interior wall of the aircraft gets a coat of aluminium over grey primer and a light wash to bring out the detail of the skin structure. There are a couple of windows that need to go in to each side. Then the internal parts can be fitted. The main floor goes in with the spars passing out of the sides and the radio compartment with its floor goes in behind. The tail wheel compartment also goes in at this stage, followed by these wall cabinets. Now to the nose of the aircraft. The floor is painted mahogany again and the two cruise seat supports can be added, followed by the seats. Next there are some storage cases on the starboard side and into the bottom of this slots the arm for part of the bomb site. Then another sighting piece goes in the front of the floor. With that done, the floor can take its place in the nose of the port half of the fuselage. I'll take a moment now to make the rudder which comes in two halves. Then back to the fuselage and another box of radio bits goes onto the port wall of the nose. And then the fuselage is ready to be joined together. The two halves slot really quite well together, but need a bit of fiddling around to make sure all the alignment tabs click into place. The rudder needs to go into the fin at this point too. Then tape it all up and leave it to set. Now the instructions say to make the belly ball turret before joining the two halves, but I'm going to do it separately. The upside of this is that it's easier to paint with a spray or brush. The downside is that it's fiddly to get back into place later. Anyway, I made up the support for the turret and glued it into the fuselage already. Now onto the wings and for some reason they say to paint the interior with black. I did as I was told but I don't know how I'm ever going to see it. Anyway, the first real job is to start assembling the undercarriage bays on the lower halves of the wings. There's a front wall, the engine firewall, that goes into place at the front and there's an oil tank to fit into the wheel well. There's a nice structural support arm that goes in at the top as well. There is then this piece that blocks off ventilation inlets, followed by these larger inlet bodies for these air scoops. 
Then there's a piece here that fits in that has outlet louvers in it. With all those pieces in place, the upper half of each wing can be attached to the lower. Then the ailerons go in. I found that one of them had a large overspill in the moulding that needed to be cut and filed out so that the aileron could actually fit on. And then finally, the wings themselves can slip over the spars and join the fuselage. Leave everything to dry, preferably overnight. And before I settle down, I'll make the ball turret for the belly position. First the gun mount goes into the shell, then the sides of the turret need to go in. These have unpleasant amounts of flash and they are very brittle to cut away, so do be very careful. Once the guns have been set in place, the sides of the turret can be assembled. Place the arm plate for segment in first, then you can join the two halves of the turret together. Now I'm going to let that set overnight along with the fuselage. New day, new job, and I'm going to make a start on the engines. Now, with the fuselage, there's an awful lot of detail that I'm really not sure I will ever see again. In fact, I know I'll never see again. Anyway, I've painted these cylinders in aluminium with black in between, and then I've given them a wash with black to bring out the detail. This is done on both the front and the back faces. I'll also add a splash of oil for colour. Now I need to let all that dry. Down that downtime, I'll apply some painting masks. I've got the Edward CX-464 set specifically for the Airfix B17G. What you need to do is to align the paper with the layout in the instructions first, then use a really sharp pointed knife to pick up the pieces one by one and transfer them to the transparency you want to mask. With the B17, that's a whole lot of masking, let me tell you. Top tip is concentrate on this rather than making sure it's inside the camera view. You end up with a less impressive video to share, but I think a better model. I'll try harder next time. Some parts, like this navigation dome, only have the edges masked, so you fill in the rest with either spare paper or liquid mask like I'm doing here. Okay, the engines are dried now, so I'm adding a brass accent to what I presume are fuel lines. Then to the rear of each engine, I add the inlet manifolds. The exhaust collector ring, painted in burnt iron, goes on two of these. I'll do the other two later. Back to the transparencies now, and the tail gunner's position is made out of transparent plastic. Fit the two halves together first. Then add the gun support post to the rear piece. Add the guns to their mounts. Then the rear piece can be slotted onto the two sides. There's another piece that slots in from the back. I'm guessing these are ammo chests for the guns. When everything's all set, the tail piece can fit underneath the rudder. Although I have to say it wasn't as slick a fit as the instructions suggest. Got there in the end though. Next is the chin turret, a central mount with a gun on either side. The back of these turret has two windows. I'm going to assume that these are included in case you have the turret slewed to one side, in which case they're visible, because if they're pointing straight ahead, you won't see them. But anyway, leave them to dry. Next, the forward upper turret. This has a ring on top of this rotating mount, like so. The guns sit on the ring like this. Then the whole piece goes in behind the cockpit area. Placing the transparent parts now, all again secured with contactor clear. First on is the observation dome, followed by the main cockpit roof. Then there's also a small window in the roof of the nose. At the back is the crew entry door. Now I'm going to start to assemble the chin turret. The guns go through the front half, 
Then the back goes on. The whole thing they can then just slot into the recess under the nose. Finally, a fairing sits behind the turret, obscuring those two little windows. Then I'm going to add a gun to the rear dorsal window, but I'll place the window itself in much later. I'm also fitting guns to the nose windows on each side. These go into place with contactor clear, as does the nose window itself. Now all of that needs to dry. I'm going to spray the whole aircraft aluminium, so I need first a coat of gloss black primer on the model. This again is sprayed on. While that's drying I can do a few other things, like gluing together the tailplane sections and making the tyres. Both of these are clamped to set up. With the primer dry, I can add the aluminium. I'm using a Dural colour, it's Duraluminium, very slightly darker than bare metal. While that sets, I'm back to the wheels, which I'll spray in tyre black, both the main wheels and the tail wheel. When the aluminium's dry, I'll mask off for the yellow and black identification markings. I normally spray yellow over a white base. For the engine exhausts, I'm using black for the worst of the staining. While I've got black in the spray, I'll take a moment to do the propellers too. Then when the black soot has dried, I'm going to add a brown engine soot colour sprayed on top. I'll also dab some of this soot into the exhausts themselves. Finally, I've masked off the tail identification stripes and I'm spraying with dark green. Now if you do this and use this colour, just be aware, this takes forever to get it out of your airbrush, or indeed out of brushes. I can also make a start on some of the decals at this point. On the underside of the engine pods are the exhausts going into the turbochargers. The outer engines are identical and have their exhaust collectors at the bottom. The inner engine exhausts are handed one for each side. So you set the collector rings on the back of the engine first, then add the exhaust pipes to the engine pods. These are in the lower outer quadrant. The engines line up with a slot in the wing and the exhaust outlets I've just added. Then I'll add the cooling flaps to each engine pod. The inner faces of the nacelles are painted in olive drab before the yellow engine cowlings, already pre-painted, are put into position. And now I let all that dry. In the meantime, back to the wheels and the wheel hubs need to be placed into the tyres. Now this I found to be a really tight fit. Also, I can put the stencils on the propeller blades. There are 12 of them, so this takes some time. Back to the engines, and I'm adding the centre body of the turbo now in contrasting aluminium tones. Then onto the undercarriage. The main leg sits firmly into a slot at the back of the bay, with the actuator leg sitting into the very front corner. This bracing hinge fits in alongside. And while I'm down here, I'll make sure to fit this exhaust shroud. For the tail gear, the support frame fits together from two pieces very simply. Then the wheel just slots onto the stub axle. The whole thing sits inside the bay. Next up, I've got the bomb bay doors to do. The actuators have this extra piece moulded onto them for stability. This needs to be trimmed off before they go on. Each actuator arm sits against the Bombay bulkheads with pins to locate them and the inner arm sitting beneath the structural member as you're looking at it. 
The door sits in the slots on the edge of the bay and nestles up against the actuators. Next the main wheels can go on, arrange the flat spot for the weighting roughly in place then put the model onto a table to adjust before your glue sets. Now I'm going to add that upper rear gun and window, contact to clear as usual. The last big thing is to assemble the tailplane. First the elevators go into the tailplanes themselves, then the whole thing fits into the fuselage. I left it late in the build to make masking the colours easier, but you know what, I needn't have bothered. I could have done this a lot earlier. Just touch up the paint at the join. Next some landing lights for the wings. These are transparent pieces. I paint the back of them with a bit of silver paint. Then the covers can go on, again with contactor clear. Now the propellers and the propeller shafts poke through this oil pump, then into the back of the propeller itself. The whole thing fits into the engine body with an alignment tab. Then I'll just quickly go around the plane, fitting in the last few aerials. And then finally, the rest of the guns. The ball turret goes into position in the belly. It's a tight squeeze to get it through, but it does go in. Then the waste guns go into their windows. And that is that. My B-17G is finally complete. I've done a little bit of weathering on it already, and I'll probably go back and do a bit more work on it later on. But otherwise, I think it's looking pretty good. So there we go. That's the kit. It's a great one. It will reward a bit of time and effort and it is really suitable more for someone who's made one or two kits in the past. However, do spend the time and you will get an amazing result. Now, if you've liked the video, do please remember to subscribe to the channel. Click on the link in the bottom right corner there and you'll see more videos that I've made. Get notification of new ones and new projects as they turn up. Don't forget to check out Monday Matters every Monday for news and views and occasional rumours and also what I'm up to for the following week. You might also want to check out Figure Friday if you're into figure painting and wargaming. In any case, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.